Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, welcome to Days of Revolt. Today we're going to discuss the inevitable catastrophe caused by climate change. Even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, temperatures would continue to rise uh, two, three degrees from heat trapped in the atmosphere and the oceans. Uh, and how we are to respond to the consequences of climate change uh, not only as citizens, but as artists and the role of culture in times of distress, its vital role. And with me to discuss this issue is Josh Fox, whose new film, How to Let Go of the World and Love All the Things that Climate Can't Change, looks precisely at the role of culture in sustaining the human spirit in times of despair. Uh, he was one of the founders of Theaters Against War, um, which after 9-11 was 500 member theaters in the New York area. Mm -hmm. And the theater community in New York in particular after the war was maybe perhaps the only community that addressed the reality and the horror of war and the danger of hubris. Uh, he wrote, directed, and shot the very fine documentary Gasland. Um, and his new film will open at the IFC Center in New York on April 20th, Earth Day, yeah. and then go to LA, what, on the 29th? Yeah. Well, Earth Day is the 22nd, but it's two days before Earth Day, right. but we run that whole week. So. Started by Ralph Nader. Right. <laughs> um, I, I love the film. and. I, I, it was, I told you before we went on camera that what was fascinating is that it had so many parallels with my book, Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. I open by laying out, as you do in the film, the very stark and frightening reality mm -hmm. that we face. And maybe you can just begin by laying out what that reality is. Sure. I, I mean, this film opens with our victory against fracking right. in the upper Delaware River Basin. And, and if people who've seen Gasland know right. that that area um, is a very, very important ecological area, not just to me because I live there, but also because it's the watershed for 16 million people. So communities and, and grassroots organizations rose up and won a victory against the oil industry that no one thought we would win. Um, in 2011, the River Basin Commission takes the river basin off the table, no fracking and no drilling. So it begins with a victory dance, you know. Right. And you um, open and end with a dance. <laughs> well, literally, a, right. Um, and, and what is it, the Beatles? What are you dancing to? Yeah, is that well, right? <laughs> that's what it is. Um, and there's, there's so much music in the film, and right. music and, and dance and, and, and poetry play such a role in, in these films as I think a lot, you know, that's the. the most important part of it to me in, in, in some ways as a writer. Um, and the reporting has to match that. But, um, you know, so it opens with this victory. And then I realized quickly, though, that, and all I want to do is stay at home, like hang out by the stream, enjoy nature, understand what it is to be in these woods, which are now no longer threatened. And then looking up and seeing that uh, the hemlock forests. Right are now being eaten by uh, this. By, on the whole East Coast. On, uh, well, from all the way from Virginia, uh, projected to go all the way up to Maine, as the climate warms, this uh, parasite called the woolly adelgid is eating these iconic right. hemlock forests, and we will lose them. And we will lose them. Uh, and that is something that's happening because of warming. And we should warming. say the percentage of hemlocks are, in terms of our forest on the East Coast is huge. Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're a keystone species. So they're like, a, they're like the, the rest of the forest depends on them. So what happens when we don't have hemlocks? We don't know the answer right. to that. And what happens to the rest of the ecosystem? We don't know what happens. But we do know that they're, they're being eaten and they're being eaten because of climate change. And that's a huge wake up call. And I realized that even though we could beat the frackers in our own backyard, we might lose everything we love about that area to climate um, and to the changing climate. And then just a few months after that, New York City gets hit by Hurricane Sandy. Right. So it's a double whammy that pulls me in to this question of 
the climate. Um, and of course, when you're working on fossil fuel issues and extraction, gas, oil, coal, you're going to end up with climate. This is never just about our backyard piece of reality, fighting off an extractive industry in our, because we don't want it around us. No one is exempt from climate change. Everyone is imperiled. And the first part of that film is very, very dark look at how too late it is. Yeah. You know, we always talk about how it's too late, but just how, just how too late it is. Well, you had a figure in there that, yeah. that I hadn't heard, and it was that by 2020, if we do not stop 80% of carbon emissions, mm -hmm. the Greenland ice sheet will disappear. Yeah, it's doomed to collapse. And that was uh, uh, Lester Brown, who is a, a very, w um, you know, he's one of the leaders in terms of projections on climate and in terms of renewable energy planning. Yeah, 80% carbon reduction by 2020 or else we lose the Greenland ice and, 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 and as you do in the film, what are the consequences of that? Well, uh, I mean, there are many, many projections. Um, some people say that we hit two degrees, that the window to, to keeping climate change at two degrees closes in 2017. So some of those projections are even earlier than 2020. Right. Um, but basically, once we hit two degrees, we enter into an unstoppable process where we uh, bring about five to nine meters of sea level rise. Well, I just want to interrupt. I mean, you in the film point out that it's not like we stop at two degrees. No. That that becomes not essentially, now. once we hit two degrees, it just begins to accelerate. Well, the problem is we've already warmed the earth by about a degree Celsius over, uh, you know, pre-industrial times. We have enough... Um, heat and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and methane in the atmosphere now to bring us definitely to 1.5 degrees, perhaps beyond. Right. Some of the projections for this year even bring us to 1.3, and we're talking Celsius, right? right? It doesn't sound like so much, but if you think about like your freezer at home, if you take it from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, everything starts to melt and right. everything starts to spoil, right. which is what's happening on the, on the planet Earth right now. Everything that's supposed to stay frozen is melting, and that has created, um, you know, feedback loops and all of the things that we know will continue to accelerate. Explain feedback loops. Well, okay, so at the top of the earth and at the bottom of the earth, there are these poles which have white snow and ice and that Reflect reflects, heat. white reflects uh, heat and light and black absorbs it, right? So that heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space because it's reflecting off the poles as the poles shrink, as we melt them, then all of a sudden there is even less reflectivity. So that's one feedback loop. Another feedback loop is that as we melt the permafrost, there's all sorts of methane trapped inside the permafrost. That creates even greater greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, these things start to accelerate and spiral. Um, but what's but you, most you also talk about the animal agriculture industry, which of, many people avoid, but is a major contributor to climate change. Of course. I mean, there's so many contributors, not just oil and gas and, and coal, um, but yes, animal agriculture. Uh, and deforestation is another major right. cause because trees basically bring carbon into them and exhale uh, oxygen, which we need to survive. So the more we cut down the forest, you get less oxygen, you get more carbon dioxide. Um, but what was most startling to me is the sea level rise projections. When you get five to nine meters of sea level rise, that's basically say goodbye to Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, D.C., Baltimore. You show in the film what it will look like, yeah. what these cities will look like, uh, you yeah. know, and, he, you know, huge sections of these cities are gone. Are gone. Yeah. And in New York, it's always interesting because whenever I show that map to people in New York, you, you see the Lower East Side get eaten. You see the, the Williamsburg and Red Hook and the Rockaways. And then people always go, well, I live over here <laughs> at Park Slope. I'm on the hill. And I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. Yeah, you're right. You know, the Brooklyn Bridge won't be underwater, but the on-ramp will be. Right, right. <laughs> you know, the, how are you going to think you're not going to be able to take the subway? You know, so it's like, it's, it's so funny how we think these things aren't going to happen to us. Right. And yet that is extraordinarily startling. So what does this mean at, this, at two degrees? Basically what it means is if we're already for all intents and purposes at 1.5 or beyond, right? There is no scenario in which New York, Baltimore, DC, Miami, New Orleans stays above water if we continue to develop and, and drill for more fossil fuels. And just today, the oil and gas industry had a huge auction in the super, Superdome um, in New Orleans to, 
10 more years of oil and gas drilling uh -huh. offshore. We're talking about fracking, ga frack gas expanding. We have proposals right now for 300 frack gas power plants throughout the United States, and people are b battling them every single place we go. They're battling the pipelines, they're battling the power plants. Hillary Clinton speaks of natural gas as a bridge fuel. Right. So does Barack Obama, by the way. What that bridge means is 30 to 40 more years of dependence on a fossil fuel, the worst fossil fuel that there is for climate change. That's not responsible action. That's not what it says in the Paris Accords. That's not what these, so you have an incredible contradiction right now among you know, this administration that's saying, okay, we want to take on climate change. We want to keep climate change well below two degrees is what they said in Paris. And yet you have FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, permitting all these pipelines. Oh, well, you, I think you point out when you look at the, you know, the climate change conference in Paris, mm -hmm. that there is, of course, all this rhetoric that acknowledges the problem and uh, but the reality of Paris was that it was a huge step backwards. Yeah, well, in Copenhagen in 2009, when we set the, de the target at two degrees, you know, we at least said that that was 2009. The current INDCs, which are the, the, the commitments that nations have made to reduce emissions, lead us toward down a path of 3.5 degrees right. Celsius. Right. So actually, yeah, many analysts said this is actually a step back from Copenhagen. Copenhagen was regarded as a, as a disaster. Right. As a, as a, you know, so when you have what the scientists are saying, James Hansen just came out with a record-breaking report talking about how sea level rise is accelerating faster than right. we think, and you have someone like Lester Brown coming out and saying, yes, this is, these are the numbers, you know, or Bill McKibben with his Do the Math tour that I was on with him saying, these are the numbers. You have well, to you, keep... You interview some of these people and they tear up. I mean, Colbert, the... Uh, yeah. wrote The Sixth Great Extinction, yeah. you know, and it's quite moving. And then in the film, when you lay out the inevitability of so much of what's coming and the uh, failure on the part of the elites to respond rationally to what's coming, you have this moment where, um, you know, you're overwhelmed. Totally. Well, there's, it's called the overwhelmed section, and it is overwhelming. And, you know, I... Th the thing with this movie is that we wanted to try to make what would be a whole climate change movie in the first 35 minutes. The normal cycle of we're doomed and this is why. Because the point of the film was not to tell people what we already know, which is a, right. a lot of this, but then to say, well, what do we do now? Right. And how do we move through this? What, what, because I feel like we get trapped in this um, sort of tennis match between denial and despair. Right. You know, on the one hand, you have despair that says, oh, this is the worst news that you could possibly get. You know, you're going to lose the major cities. 30 to 50 percent of all the species on the planet go extinct at two degrees. You know, Elizabeth uh, Colbert unbelievably despondent in her interview about the species, and it, and it shows, and we show the emotion. We, right. don't leave, we don't leave the emotion out of this movie. Right. This isn't a dry film. This isn't a scientific essay. This is an emotional roller coaster ride. You know... So what do you do with that? And then on the other hand, you don't want to, You can't just deny it and forget about all of this stuff. So I believe in the power of catharsis. I believe that when you go through the feelings of these things and you allow yourself to feel it, there is something on the other side of that. And that that is where the real information is. So the film, yeah, it, it, you know, because we start off like gaslighting, like, oh, well, okay, well, we just won on fracking. How bad could this be? You know, and you walk in like Forrest Gump kind of, naive about it and then that naivete comes crashing down very very quickly and then you realize well what do we have left to fight for what are we fighting for that's the second part of the title um which is all the things that climate can't change uh the voiceover you know my my question is you know what are the things that are so deep inside of us that no storm can take them away so what are those things those are our civic virtues those explain are, that explain that well, in times of crisis, the worst in us can come out and the best in us can come out, right? In the Rockaways, you saw, you know... The You're talking about which was hit by Hurricane hit Sandy. Hit by Hurricane Sandy, a huge problem uh, caused by climate change or, or worsened by climate change. You saw looting, you saw gangs ruling the night. In the day, so that was the worst in, in us in a lot of ways. And the best in us was you had community centers that rebuilt their communities out of, you know, 
just sheer gumption and going out there and doing Well, you had church work. basements that, and people would bring in food and diapers and cleaning equipment. And it, it was remarkable. Occupy Sandy, 25,000 volunteers a day. Right. You know, so our spirit towards community, generosity, um, human rights, democracy, courage, innovation, these are the things that are so inside of us that, that climate can't change. And, and if we're going to look at a world which starts to spiral out of control in terms of the climate, we simply cannot have humanity spiral out of control along with it. You know, in, during Hurricane Katrina, when you saw all those people on the bridge trying to get out of flooded New Orleans, and then on the other side of it, the cops with shotguns trying to hold them back, this wasn't a climate change problem. This was a humanitarian problem. Yeah. This was man's inhumanity to man. And, 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 and our civilization right now is based on greed, on competition, and on violence. And if we continue to have those as the bulwarks of our system, we're, not go we're gonna see an incredible calamity with the, with the rising seas and all the things that are coming. So we have to start thinking about different sense of value structure that's based on, uh, you know, on creativity, based on community, based on human rights, based on um, the things on love. Well, let's you know? talk about, you know, those disciplines mm -hmm. that grapple with those values. Mm -hmm. um, poetry, right. dance, which yeah. plays, music. And you go to indigenous communities, I think it's quite moving, where um, they find that spirit of resistance yeah. uh, with the Pacific Islanders. So let's take a look at your trailer. about this sequence, you should probably know that the downside of what we were about to do was, you know, um, this is the short list. Drowning, arrest, run over by boats, all kinds of sharks, jellyfish, getting punched, sea creatures, drifting away in currents out into the Pacific Ocean, cultural disrespect, big waves, well, you get the idea. I think from the film, they're sustained by their culture, their tradition, and their art. But so are we. I mean, how, how I mean, what is America without the art, without the culture, without, you know, we've, so I We've think, done a pretty good culture war here. <laughs> well, the truth is that um, if we are, and this is the message for the movement as well, we have to strengthen those virtues yeah. and those values. Those are not answers. You're right to say that they're mysteries. You know, what does this mean to get good at creativity? What does it mean to be good at community? What does it mean to strengthen our generosity, our ability to, to, to innovate? And how do we do that? You know, I believe in the future, knowing your neighbors is going to be more important than your property line because these things will start to break down. And if one, when that crisis comes, we have to start to be better. And so I think the film, yes, absolutely gravitates towards, um, towards the people who have no choice, who never say die. And yeah, the indigenous environmental monitors going, trekking, kilometers into the oil, um, to the jungle to find oil spills that no one is reporting on. The Pacific Climate Warriors, who you mentioned, blockading the port of Newcastle, the largest coal port in the world in Australia, with hand-carved traditional canoes up against boats that are the size of the Empire State Building. People speaking out in China about um, the pollution and the human rights catastrophe there, even at pain of them losing their own civil liberties. These are the people who I think you, you have to look to um, the communities that are on the front lines about how we organize ourselves going forward. And what role does, we see it in the film, but what role does something as elemental as dance, you know, mm -hmm. which I see you play a lot with <laughs> in the film. Well, I did a dance sequence sort of like to begin the movie thinking as a joke and then everybody loved it and then all of a sudden <laughs> you can't get out of it. But it ended up being one of the most profound things in the film because we end the film with a dance also. Yeah. And every time we show this movie out on the road, and we're in the middle of a tour, and we're doing it in theaters, but we're also touring to all these places that are in the middle of a grassroots fight against fossil fuels, right? So that's the Let Go and Love tour, and we're taking it to places that are fighting power plants and LNG terminals and pipelines. 
At the end of the movie, we get that whole audience dancing with us. And when that audience gets up and starts dancing, and, I, and we finish that, and there's, a, and there's a round of applause, not just for us, but for everybody, right? I say to them, you know, you feel that blood pumping yeah. in your vein? That's the movement. Yeah. That's, that's the right. movement. That's right. And it's a double entendre, right? Because it's the movement that got you that way. But it's also, that's what we mean by we're in a movement. Yeah. Well, I end my book the same way you end your film, which is that, you know, we must empower the imagination, uh, the human imagination, the moral imagination, in order to envision another way to relate to each other and to the ecosystem. Um, one that doesn't uh, cater to the dominant vices of culture, which you mentioned, violence and greed and exploitation. Um, and I have, uh, my youngest son is eight. And when we took him at about three to see the Nutcracker for the first time. He broke down and he wouldn't leave the auditorium. He was uh, just my wife and, and he, he's sobbing going, I want to be a dance. And it was like being struck by lightning. I enrolled him in, there's a local ballet school and he hasn't stopped. And so I, like you, I'm very cognizant of what's coming and struggle with despair. And yet I find myself with my eight-year-old in a ballet studio day after day. And I was there not long ago, and um, everyone left the studio, and he was alone. And suddenly he, he started leaping and spinning, you know, the way he taught himself to spot, where you turn your head at a faster rate than you turn your body, mm -hmm. as dancers can do. Uh -huh. And I watched him spin all the way around that studio. Yeah. And I thought, it's people like my son who are going to save the world. You know, it's, these, like I said, these are the things that climate can't change. Because we, we get so down the road of, oh my God, the flood and famine and refugees. And yes, these are things that we cannot deny. And the film doesn't pull its punches. And you can't, you really look it in the face. It's a dark, dark picture. And, you know, at the same time, these are the things that can bring us back together and bring us back to center. And this is what we have to celebrate. I mean, you gotta ask yourself, you know, if you look throughout evolutionary history, you have the dinosaurs, you have ice ages, you have all this stuff, what makes humanity worth saving? It's not the Dunkin' Donuts on the corner. It's not the Walmart down the street. It's certainly not our political system uh, in the way that it's currently being manipulated by all this huge, big money. Um, it's, it's not f fascism. It's not totalitarianism. It, it, it's music. It's art. Yeah. It's generosity. It's culture. It's community. These are the things that make us something worth keeping on this planet. No, it's like Leon Staff in the Warsaw Ghetto. We, we needed poetry in some ways more than bread. It's a part of justice. 